these field workers have come to take tree measurements and soil samples from this site close to Mount Kilimanjaro in northern Tanzania. They are part of Tanzania's National Forestry Assessment Project, or NAFORMA, run by the Tanzanian government and the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, and funded by Tanzania and Finland. The team is collecting information on the number, size and quality of trees, as well as assessing the forest's so-called carbon pools, one of which is soil. Forest soils are a massive carbon stock. Activities such as deforestation release carbon from the soil, significantly increasing the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Soil store two to three times as much carbon as living plants, so it is really important. And the problem is that we don't know yet how this carbon uh, stored in the soils could, can be released to the atmosphere if the land use, for example, changes from forestry to agriculture. And this is, this is one of the questions that the NAFORMA Soil Survey tries to address. NAFORMA field teams are collecting data from 3,400 sites around the country, including collecting soil samples from more than a quarter of these. Each sample is then brought to this laboratory, where it's analysed to establish its carbon content. Now we know that we have some areas which are highly fertile, and those needs maybe to have some other ways of conserving it, so that we can have really maintain the carbon stocks in those areas. Areas such as this on the slopes of Kilimanjaro, where farmers have been developing their own form of climate-smart agroforestry over centuries. The principal crops are coffee and bananas, grown under a canopy of trees. While farming is intensive, the farmers can serve water and recycle all organic matter to ensure their methods are sustainable. However, these farms are threatened due to falling coffee prices. It's hoped in a form of data will bring better policy making that will support sustainable agroforestry systems like these by demonstrating their many environmental benefits, including the uptake and storage of large amounts of carbon. If Tanzania can successfully sustain and even increase its carbon stocks, it stands to gain from the United Nations initiative to reduce carbon emissions through deforestation and degradation, also known as RED, which aims to reward developing countries who can demonstrate a reduction in their carbon emissions. The main aim of RED initiative is to try capturing the excessive carbon within the atmosphere to the forest. We will come out with the change, you see? The change of how much carbon has been added from, from the atmosphere to our, to our forest stores and, uh, and, 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 and uh, how, will he, how much then should we pay for that story. Benefiting both the international community and Tanzanians themselves by mitigating climate change. When I was young, it used to rain a lot here which made the climate very conducive to agriculture and crops matured quickly. But now the rains are completely unpredictable, so when you plant, the crop sometimes withers. The soil survey being carried out here is one of the most extensive efforts in tropical forests to produce more information on the role of soils in climate change. If that can be understood, it will provide not only Tanzania, but also other tropical nations with the information they need to sustainably manage their forest resources, allowing them to provide for their growing populations and reduce their carbon emissions. For Hungry Planet, I'm Charlotte Windle. Water, the essential ingredient for life. But here in the northeast of Brazil, water shortages are a chronic problem. With 22 million people, it's the most densely populated semi-arid region in the world. And it has the highest concentration of rural poverty in all of Latin America. Low erratic rainfall and cyclic droughts have made farming difficult. For generations, farmers have resorted to excessive use of chemicals and slash and burn agriculture. The result is soil depleted of nutrients, eroded land, and a damaged ecosystem. 
Until a few years ago, Irupuan Gomez was one of those farmers. He cleared the land through burning and used chemical fertilizers. Gradually, the soil became less productive until it reached a crisis point. We got together in the community. We were all concerned about the health of our families. There was a lot of malnutrition and a lot of pollution, and we knew we couldn't survive here. This small community turned to a local project for help. This project works with 15,000 families in the northeast region. Supported by IFAD, the UN agency dealing with rural poverty alleviation, it promotes agroecology using no chemicals and no burning. With no natural water resources here, the project advisors suggested a whole new approach to farming. Irupuan agreed to try out bush management techniques to rehabilitate the natural ecosystem. He created ground cover, removed invasive species and replanted native trees. Here we are dealing with customs that go from father to son over generations. If you explain that they can produce without burning, just to preserve the environment, some will do it. But when you show in doing this that they can also make a profit, it becomes much easier. And this community certainly profits. Trees now attract bees, resulting in a successful honey business. And the offcuts from the trees feed the goats. There used to be only five goats per family. Now there are 75. Instead of buying milk, the people here now sell the excess. From the initial one hectare trial area, this community is now managing 120 hectares. If it wasn't for this work, I believe we wouldn't be surviving on the land now. The project team has been monitoring the changes. It's up to seven degrees cooler here since the project started, and birds and animals have returned. We need the land, and the land needs us. For us to live well, we need to give the land its comfort. And living with the land is the only way to ensure there'll be enough food to feed the population of the future. A remote patch of desert in eastern Mauritania is an oasis of hope for thousands of people fleeing conflict and hunger in Mali. But there's nowhere to run from the heat. During the day, temperatures climb as high as 50 degrees centigrade, over 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and the dust and wind are unrelenting. There are no paved roads to Umbera. The nearest one ends over 200 kilometers away. Okay, so right now the road is dusty, it's, it's bumpy, uh, but you can drive across it. In a few months, the rainy season will begin, and all of this dust outside will turn to mud, and it'll take an entire month for a WFP food truck to get where the refugees are located. And that's why it's so critical that we get the food there now so that we'll have it in a few months when the rains start. Eli Ould Hassan is a herder from northern Mali. He says it took his family eight days to reach the camp, and they had to leave all of their animals behind. There wasn't much to eat along the way, and his five-year-old son Yusuf looks thin and frail. He isn't alone. The long journey takes a heavy toll on children. At this hospital, run by Medicine Sans Frontier, doctors say that many of the camp's youngest residents arrive malnourished. Talking to mothers like Fatima, it's not hard to understand why. Seven months pregnant, she made the difficult journey across the desert after her husband was killed in the fighting. Families like Ali and Fatima's are surviving on food provided to them by the World Food Program. 
So we're at a distribution center right now, and in a moment we'll begin uh, handing out food to around 10,000 people. Each one of them will receive rice, beans, salt, sugar, and oil, uh, and that's enough to get them by for a few weeks. It's a hard life for the refugees and full of uncertainty. As a result of drought across the Sahel region of Africa, local residents here in Mauritania don't have it much easier. This is where the host population, the people who have accommodated all the refugees we saw back at the camp live. But by cruel coincidence, this is also one of the regions in Mauritania that's been hit hardest by the drought in the Sahel. Now, Mauritanians are very hospitable people, but the people who live in this village just don't have a lot to share. Drought and conflict have brought hardship to residents and refugees alike. With the rains closing in, time is running out to deliver the help that they need. Thank <laughs> you.